Hello, and welcome to Big Think Live. I'm Jason Gotts, and I'm here with Maddie Grant. She's the co-founder of Social Fish, a social media consulting firm, and the co-author with Jamie Nodder of Humanize, How People-Centric Organizations Succeed in a Social World. Maddie, welcome to the program. Thank you. So corporations aren't people has been a very common political refrain by people disaffected with Wall Street in the wake of the 2008 crash, yet your book suggests that corporations are becoming more and more like people all the time. How is this the case, um, and why is it good for both companies and individuals? Well, actually, what we say in the book is that corporations should become more human all the time. Uh, so I don't know that we're there yet. But what we're seeing is that uh, the deep changes brought about by social media in the way that we interact with companies and with brands are actually really disruptive to the way we traditionally work. So if we can incorporate some of these social media things, these human aspects, into how we work, then we'll flourish as companies in the future. That's our theory. Do you, do you see some companies, um, particularly I'm interested in, in established, like, you know, austere kind of classical companies that, that are adopting social media faster and more effectively than others, um, you know, as a, uh, one would expect it to be natural among small Silicon Valley type companies, but... Yeah, there's a lot of adoption among um, quite large companies, um, obviously mostly technology related companies like, you know, IBM or Dell. Um, but we're seeing every single company in every industry uh, affected in some way, large or small, by social media. So uh, the future is that every single industry will be touched if they're not already. And some industries are, are extremely disrupted already by social media, obviously. So like, what are some of the biggest ways in which social media is disrupting industry and why are people-centric organizations much more likely now to succeed you know, than, than ones that are not? Well, the ways that uh, companies are disrupted have to do with the fact that through social media, uh, we, the people, are able to create and share and communicate and collaborate and solve problems without necessarily the traditional structures that were in place before. So we can get our information you know, through search instead of going through traditional channels, for example. So um, as companies try and use this new, which is actually no longer really new, but this different way of communicating this very two-way, um, they're trying to fit these communication channels into traditional marketing and communications and PR, you know, which is because that's how we work. That's how they're used to operating. Um, but we're finding that it doesn't work so well that way. You know, people want to, to they want our the organizations to be more decentralized, more transparent, more open, uh, more collaborative, and those are things that change at a very deep internal level how we're used to working. Okay. Um, are there industries that are so opaque or just locked in or where, you know, the sort of public access to information is, is, is so limited in spite of um, these new tools available to us that they are not likely to be affected as quickly by social media? I mean, I could see, you know, United Airlines or, you know, a company that has, is in a service role having to worry about it a great deal. But what about, like, I don't know, an insurance company, for example. Well, actually, it's interesting because I happen to work with associations. So my social media consulting firm deals specifically with membership organizations. But that means that we work with a lot of trade associations. And trades are all kinds of different industry verticals. So manufacturing, real estate, you know, you name it, there's an association for it, right? right. Um, and at the end of the day, every industry has customers, has people, whether it's B2B, you know, business to business, or B2C, business to consumer. Um, every industry is part of a network of individual people. And what we're discovering through social media and through these disruptive changes is that connecting individual people within these networks, whether it's a business that deals with business or a business that deals with a consumer, um, is 
is a new way of working, basically. So really for, for everybody. And sure, there are some companies that, that may have less need to, to really think about social media than others. Um, but we're seeing very few that aren't affected. I mean, we work with you know, packaging machinery companies, and they, there are, they still have staff, and they still have customers, and they still have individual people who work within their networks and their systems. Gotcha. And um, so what, you know, I would think that it, it, when, so when companies start integrating or paying attention to social media initially, as you were saying, they sort of like make it part of their PR and they might have, you know, someone just tweeting things out, et cetera. But how, how do they get beyond um, what, you know, do you have any sort of key tips for taking it beyond just paying lip service to social media by having somebody post things on Facebook? For example, yeah, and it's it's not so much tips that I have, but what we're seeing is is exactly why we wrote the book. So we're seeing these social media hurdles for companies trying to integrate social media into their operations. So, for example, you have companies with different departments all off doing different things. You know, setting up Facebook pages and setting up Twitter accounts, and they're not collaborating collaborating with each other. To, to understand why they're doing all of these things. So that's one example. Another example is you have a company that's um, thinking about social media policies and trying to figure out who in their organization can have a Twitter account and speak you know, on the behalf of the organization. Um, but they're worried about you know, giving this level of, of public access to employees who maybe traditionally never had that. So we see these as social media integration hurdles. Um, and what we're seeing is that these are indicative of much deeper organizational issues. So in these two examples, one is that you have silos that don't communicate or don't collaborate. You know? So that's not a social media problem. That's like an organizational development problem. That's like a culture change problem. Uh, the other example with policies, maybe you don't actually trust your staff. You only trust your media spokesperson. You know, so how do you shift from a, a company that is used to having one or two people who are enabled to speak for the company to all of a sudden having a thousand people enabled to speak for the company? It's, it's again, it's a culture change. It's an organizational change. Um, so the tips that we have are actually entirely related to social media. So social media is showing us how to do these things. And maybe it's as simple as having a team of people who collaborate, you know, one person from each different department who are responsible for social media. They're the social media team. Um, but in just in the fact of being a team that sits in between these departments, they start to break down the silos. You know, or in the policies example, you set up social media guidelines that are much more about allowing people to, to um, represent you online as opposed to policing and stopping all of your employees from, from doing these things. So you use these social media implementation or tactical things in order to make some deeper organizational changes. That's very interesting. I mean, so the, you know, it would seem to me that a certain amount of policing um, is, is still necessary. I mean, you talk about having having teams working collaboratively between departments. I mean, if you have an organization that, you know, a global organization, I mean, even if it's a very good company, right? I mean, there, there, are, there are always PR gaffes, even among, even when there's only one spokesman, spokesperson mm -hmm. for the company. Um, so I, I would think that you know, it's not necessarily a simple matter to empower everyone within like a giant company to, to, to take over and speak for the company. I mean, I think there's a lot of risk involved, yes? There is a lot of risk. Uh, I think it is simpler than we think. I, th I think there's more fear than there is actual risk. So that in, a, in what we would call a human organization, Yes, you take that risk of letting potentially everybody in your company speak for the company. But at the same time, each of those individual people are asked to represent themselves as working for the company. So nobody's hiding the fact that they represent the company. And if somebody makes a mistake, especially on social media, which is very fast moving and fluid and conversational, somebody makes a mistake, that's okay. 
you know, there's, it's, it's not this huge crisis that it could be if, you know, an official media spokesperson says completely the wrong thing. I, I feel like that's a, a different uh, sort of old way of thinking about risk at the end of the day. Interesting. In some ways, maybe companies increase their risk by by limiting their voice to a single individual yes. because the the fallout is greater if that person makes a yes. mistake. Yes. So. Yeah. The risk of not being out there, not having a presence, you know, not having people representing you, uh, I think, is greater than the risk of having lots of people potentially. Okay. So, um, for pe for individuals who aren't as fluent as they might be um, with social media, how can you know, individuals not, like both in, within their companies and outside of them, how can they take advantage, uh, better advantage of some of these new tools to, um, you know, of the power that, that social media gives us uh, to make companies take action, to get things done, to organize, et cetera? Yeah, I think um, social media is very fast moving and the tools change all the time. So right now, the big three are Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So for somebody who's not a social media person, who's not really used to using social media tools, um, it's just about trying one of these, one of these obvious ones where they will know people who are using them um, and just see how they feel. Um, but you know, tomorrow it might be Pinterest, Instagram, and something else that everybody is on. So it's not about learning a new tool. It's just about communicating with the people around you in the way that they communicate. And there's a very um, kind of natural evolution of these tools where, you know, 10 years ago it was only high school kids on Facebook, for example, but now my grandmother's on Facebook, you know. So, so there, there shouldn't be any fear of trying these tools, and especially as people become more and more mobile, use their mobile phones for everything, you know, all of these tools become very, very easy and very natural to use to stay connected with friends and colleagues and, uh, and brands even. So um, it's just a matter of kind of going with the flow, really, just seeing you know, what your friends are using, what your colleagues are using. And for companies, encouraging people to try these tools is important too. So a company can say, we want to set up a Google Plus page just to see what happens, just to see who finds us that way, who connects with us that way. Um, and our employees, therefore, should just check it out, to try it and see if it works for them. And if it does, then maybe they could express interest in being on our new social media team. You know, it's, it's, all, it's a little organic that way, and that's partly what a human organization is able to do, is to, to take advantage of these kind of organic evolutions in the way that we communicate and in the way that we work. Thank you so much for being with us today, Maddie Grant. Thank uh, you. And we invite our Big Think audience to visit humanizebook.com and to check back to BigThink.com to watch uh, additional video clips from our conversation with Maddie and to find out about future live interviews with our experts. Thank you for watching.